Well, good morning, church. Hey, let's stand to our feet. We're going to give him praise today because he's won the battle for us. He's paid it all. He's worthy of our praise, our gratitude. Come on, church. We offer it to him today. And all sufficient merit is shining like the sun a fortune I inherit by no work I have done my righteousness I forfeit at my Savior's cross where all sufficient merit and did what Throne of God, and I'll 
gaze upon my Jesus and thank him for the cross. Yes, I'll thank you for the cross. Oh, it is done. It is done. Amen. Praise God. Thanks so much. We stand on that foundation, don't we? The beautiful, sufficient grace of Jesus. And nothing that we can do that deserves his grace, but yet it's this free gift that we receive through faith in him. And we stand on all that we receive in Christ because of that. Well, welcome to Fellowship. We're so glad you're here today. And just grateful for an opportunity again for us to gather to worship our Savior and our Lord today. Hey, before we jump into the, the kind of the whole of the service, I want to take a moment this morning and just for us to pray together. And uh, especially this morning to pray over kind of what's happening in the Middle East with Israel and the bombings and all that, that drones and all that that came in from Iran into Israel yesterday. So let's take a moment and just bow our heads together this morning. We don't want to really be deaf to what what's happening around our world. So this morning, as you bow this morning, just take a moment. Invite God to be a God of peace, a God of restoration. Think of Psalm 29 that says, may the Lord grant peace to his people. Father God, that's our prayer this morning. That in this world, there will be trouble. There will be hard things that come our way and that come others' way. And, and Lord, we want to ask that you would be right in the middle of it all, God, that you'd be the God of peace in the middle of war, in the middle of difficulty, in the middle of struggle. And, and God, would you speak peace? God, we pray over the leaders of the nations and, and our nation. And God, that you would be a God that guides and directs things in the ways of you. So God, we invite you to come be in the middle of the suffering, to come be in the middle of the hurting, that you're the God that is the rescuer, and you're the God that, that can speak and bring peace in the midst of struggle and war. So God, would you be that? And Lord, I want to pray that over this room this morning too. Lord, our hearts are heavy for what's happening around the world, but we realize, God, that in this room this morning, people walk with burdens and worries and cares and struggles and maybe even physical diagnosis. They're just from this week even, and just things that walk into this room this morning that need your presence and peace. And so, God, we want to pray for that today, that your Holy Spirit is here, that you are the Prince of Peace. And God, you come and speak into every heart and every mind and the struggles that they bring into this place today as they bring them with worship, with open hands today. God, would you bless us with your presence and your peace in the middle of whatever turmoil is in the lives of those that walk in this place today. God, we turn our hearts to you. And today our worship is so much more than song. It is our trust in the middle of hard stuff. That's the worship we bring, looking to you today for all that you are. God, we love you. Thank you again for meeting us in this place. and pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, welcome to Fellowship. If you don't know, my name is Jason Beams. I'm the campus pastor here, and so great, so glad you're here. As I look around the room this morning, I, I, I realize there are many of you that this is the place you call home, but I also realize that I, there's several of you, maybe that's this is your first time, or maybe it's your second or third time, and we haven't had a chance to get to meet you yet. We would love that opportunity. Our Connection Center out either door is the spot for that. We have a gift waiting for you. Love to get to meet you, hear your name, help you get connected with what God's doing uh, through Fellowship across all of our campuses, but maybe specifically 
specifically right here in our Cabot campus and right here in the community where God's plan is. So love to help you get connected that way. Connection is a huge piece of what we are about here at Fellowship. Connecting with God, his word, his presence, but then connecting with others so that we're encouraged and blessed by others that are on the same journey as us. And then a couple opportunities for connection are coming up. One is tomorrow night. It's called Navigate. It's our, our last Navigate of the spring for men's, for our men's ministry. Men would love to you to be a part of that. Six o'clock to eight o'clock. We're going to have a great dinner that's going to be a part of that. I think kind of all you can eat, Chick-fil-A nuggets. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that word to a group of men, right? <laughs> but a lot of Chick-fil-A nuggets and sides and things that are going to be a part of that tomorrow night, six o'clock. You don't want to miss it as we open the word together, as we talk about God's presence in the midst of struggles and stress and anxiety and being the men that God's called us to be. Men, come and be a part of that. We'd love to know that you're coming so we have the right amount of chicken nuggets and things like that from Chick-fil-A. And so there is a clipboard at our Connection Center. If you just jot your name down or if you've gone online and signed up, that works as well. Either one of those. Love to get you connected uh, right here at Fellowship. Um, so many other things that are out there. There's a, a, an event at our West Little Rock campus for all campuses called Date Night that's right on the horizon. Another incredible growth opportunity, connecting with God opportunity is a, an event that we do each year the last few years called Secret Church. It's a Friday night event. It's coming up uh, towards the very end, the last Friday of the month of April. Uh, it's where we will just uh, simulcast with probably 50, 60,000 different people from around the nation. David Platt is the teacher of this, and we're gonna have a great night studying the book of Ruth. And it goes from like six to midnight, incredibly long, deep, beautiful study. And so if, if you're interested in being a part of that, I think we had 30 to 40 or so that were a part of that last year, go on our our. Uh, our our webpage, and you can sign up right there and get connected. It's gonna be a great night of just kind of fellowship and studying God's word together as well. Hey, one of our favorite things to do at fellowship is is to dedicate our children to the Lord. So this morning, we have the beautiful opportunity of of having families dedicate uh, their children to the Lord. So I'm gonna invite Greg to come and lead us through that moment. These are some of my favorite days. This and baptism are my, are my two favorite days we here, that we have here at, at Fellowship. I'm going to invite the Hollands to come up. And as I do, I want to just tell you a little bit about what we're doing today. Child dedication is, is precious to me because this is when families stand before their church and say that they're going to raise their kids to know Jesus. And, that, and that's special. That's a special promise to make in front of their church family. So I want to introduce the Hollands. We have... Hayden James Holland, so cute. His parents, Jake and Ashton, siblings, Grace Greer and Hannah. This is a sweet, sweet family. And a verse that Jake and Ashton are believing for Hayden is this. It, is, it comes from Genesis 18, 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. And Hayden, this is a blessing that your parents are believing for you. They pray that you put God first in all your decisions and that you will be an ambassador for Christ wherever you go. Now parents, I have some questions for you. Man, he's taken right after hand, isn't he? So sweet. I have some questions for you. Jake and Ashton, knowing that Hayden is a gift from God that he intentionally placed him in your care. Do you desire to dedicate yourselves and your child to the Lord? Do you accept the responsibility given by God in Deuteronomy 6 to be the primary person responsible to teach them about Jesus while partnering with the church to raise them in a Christian home? And do you commit to pray for your child on a regular basis that Jesus would become their personal savior, their treasure, and their everything? That's beautiful, that's beautiful. Well, church, this is not a one-way promise. This is not just these, these parents promising to raise their children, but, it's a prom but this is a time for us as a church to promise to support them. So church, here's a question I have for you. Church, having witnessed this family and their desire to dedicate their child, as much as it is up to you, will you offer your help and support through whatever means to help these parents fulfill their vows? That's beautiful. Church, I'm gonna pray for us. I'm gonna pray for us. God, we come before you on behalf of the Hollands. God, I just pray for Jake and Ashton. God, as they raise these four sweet kids to know you. God, I pray for Hayden. 
God, that he would know at a young age that he is, that he is set apart, that he is purposed, that there is a God that loves him deeply. God, I pray that he, that he grows up knowing that there, is, that there is something for him to do in this world, and that is to glorify you and declare Jesus as his Savior. God, I pray for Jake and Ashton, God, just that they would have the love in their hearts and the words in their mouth to speak life over their children. God, that they would be parents who would boldly raise their children to know and follow your son. God, I pray for us, their church family, God, that you would impress on our hearts the, the, the need and the obligation for us to surround every family in this place and support them as they raise their kids and their students to know and follow you. God, we pray for the Hollands. We pray a blessing over them. As a head out today, God, we just pray that you would guide, guard, and direct them. God, we love you and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. Well, hey, let's stand up and uh, we're going to continue in worship this morning. We sing that he's holy, he stands above them all. There's no one beside him. There's no one above him. There's nobody like him. So come on, we worship him this morning. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song with me to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your name is the greatest
24, I mean, Acts 13, 24 says that the word of God increased and then the word of God multiplied. That's the language it uses in Acts 13, 24. 
As we move into a type of offering today, I just want to give you guys an update. Last fall, kind of our theme this year, making much of God, we took a, a, an offering across all of our campuses for, I don't know if you remember, but called the Seeds Project, Bible Translation. We're translating the Bible through this organization and uh, in parts of the Bible for four different languages in Southeast Asia. And again, across all of our campuses, our, our campuses donated $215,000 towards getting the Word of God translated it in the hands of those who even to this day still aren't able to taste of the goodness of the Word of God. So again, church, we just want to say a huge thank you for, for giving in that kind of way. And, and just a quick update, that those, those Bible translations have started. They're on their way. You're going to see more throughout the rest of this year. Maybe I think we have a video that will be coming out that speaks a little bit to that here in the near future. But we just wanted to pause again this morning and just remind you of that, to be praying that the Word of God will multiply and increase, not just right here in Cabot, Arkansas, but around the world. And that when you give here at Fellowship, that you give to projects like that, you give to ministry like that, that takes the Word of God and, and gives it to the lives of people that transforms everything. So kind of a, um, this morning, as you, you come into this moment, we're, we're so grateful for the way you give, church. Thank you so much. And if you came prepared to give today as a, a part of your offering or part of your worship, just know how we do that at Fellowship's a little bit different. We don't pass the plate, but we have offering boxes at back of both both sides of the room. You could drop that offering there if that's what you came prepared to do today. Or, or many of you, I know, give online so faithfully. You can do that at fellowshipar.com slash give or text the, the word give to the text number on the screen or even through our app. All of those ways, church, thank you again for giving so faithfully and allowing God to use you in ministry right here where you live. As people wait on the Lord and as, the, as God comes and interrupts people's lives and as we send the gospel around the world, even through translating the word into languages that don't yet have it. Thank you for how you give, church. We're so grateful for you. I want us to pray for a moment. Just bow your heads and take a moment this morning and pray over the Bible translation. Southeast Asia, even in the weeks that we're living in right now, Bible translation is happening in four different languages through the monies and the gifts that you gave. And so just pray this morning that God will bear fruit through his word. Take a moment this morning to pray over the Bible translators. That as they read the word and as they translate it into the heart language of so many, that, that, that God will use them in their gifting in beautiful ways. That God will speak into their hearts in powerful ways as they translate the word of God. Pray that incredible fruit will come out of God's word. That a harvest will be incredibly plentiful because of the word of God and the language of these brand new heart language groups. Pray that the word of God will increase and will multiply today. God, we are so grateful for your word. In fact, God, we, we have to confess, we probably even take it for granted that we have so many copies. It's on our phone, so much access to your word. But God, your word is powerful and effective. And we know it's transformed our lives as it reveals your nature and your character and your love and your promises to us. And Lord, we know your word can transform lives around the world. And so God, we, we want to pray this morning. God, your blessing over your word to the nations. God, fill the Bible translators as they translate, transform their hearts and lives by your word. As they translate that into this heart language of four different people, God, would you use that in powerful ways? Would you bring a harvest that only you know you can bring, God, that you'd bear incredible fruit around this world? God, as we faithfully give, God, we know you work and move in powerful ways. So God, do that. What a privilege it is, God, to see you work in the hearts and lives of people on the far side of the sea, on the other side of the world. God, we pray to that end today. God, we love you. Thank you for all that you are, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Good morning. So good to be with uh, Fellowship Cabot. Uh, it's great to be uh, together today. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Fellowship. What that means is I get the humble privilege of serving alongside the staff and elders out here in Cabot, along with our staff and the elders across all six of our campuses. And so it is great to be with you today. I'm also excited because I get to continue us in our series in the book of Hebrews that we're calling Radiant Savior. And so I want to invite you to join me in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 is where we're going to be here today. Why don't you take out your Bible, your Bible app, however you like to follow along. You know, in our world, uh, oftentimes we'll say something like, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? You've probably heard that phrase before. What we mean by that is that we come up to certain situations and maybe circumstances in life that we need someone to help us. I, I remember years ago, I was taking my oldest son, Hunter, on a, a football recruiting trip to the University of Alabama. And while we were there, a large group of the players were gonna go to a basketball game. And because we were going as a group, they didn't pass out individual tickets. We were gonna kind of go into the arena all together. And, and somehow, and I can't really remember how, but my, my son and I got separated from the group and so we didn't have a ticket. And so he and I kind of go up to the people there that are taking tickets. I try to explain to this guy our situation and how we got separated from the group and how we were supposed to be in the game. He wasn't having it. <laughs> he wasn't buying it. And so I, I kept pleading my case with him and trying to tell him, hey, what we were here for and what was going on, and he wasn't having it. About that time, I looked in the concourse there of the arena, and I saw Nick Saban, who, who at the time was the head football coach at the University of Alabama. It's weird saying that. It used to be. And, and I kind of waved him down, and he saw that we had a problem. And so he comes over there and tells this ticket guy, hey, they're with me. And he said, come on in, right? And when I walked by that ticket guy, I just kind of gave him one of these, you know, <laughs> right? Like I, like I told you, right? You know, sometimes we come to situations, it's not what we know, it's who we know. We get in situations and circumstances sometimes in our life where we need somebody to vouch for us, to advocate for us, to, to mediate for us. And in life with God, there are times we need someone to vouch for us, somebody to, to advocate for us. So we, we need a mediator. And the Bible says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is our perfect advocate. He's our perfect mediator. And, he, and what we're going to see today is he is constantly vouching for us because he knows us. That's what we're talking about today. Now, if you've been tracking with us in the book of Hebrews, we have been learning together that Jesus is the greatest of all time. Man, he is, he is greater than any king. He is greater than the prophets. Uh, he is greater than Moses. He's greater than Aaron. And today, we're going to see that he is even greater than all of the priests. The priest of the Old Testament. He, he's even greater than them because he is a, a part of a different priesthood altogether. He's a part of the priesthood of a guy named Melchizedek. Now, if you've been with us in this series in Hebrew, you probably have already heard this cat's name before, Melchizedek, because it shows up in chapter five and then again in chapter six, we hear about this guy. But now the writer of Hebrew is going to go into much greater detail about him here in chapter seven. This discussion in chapter seven actually bleeds over into chapter eight, but we're, for time's sake, we're gonna spend our time today in chapter seven. So let's read this together and then we'll come back 
and talk about this. Again, we're in Hebrews 7. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but we are going to read uh, some parts of this together. Let's start with verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem. That is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God. He continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment of the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. And though these also are descended from Abraham, but this man who does not have the descent from them received tithes from Abraham, blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In this one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes and paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Verse 11. Now, if if, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that, the tribe of Moses said nothing about priest. Verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Now bump down with me to verse 23. The former priest were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. We just sang about that, right? Verse 27, he has no need like those other high priests to offer sacrifices daily. Why? First for his own sins, then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Now, I realize many of you in here don't have any idea who this Melchizedek guy is because he's not one of the Old Testament heroes, right? I mean, he, he didn't part the Red Sea. He didn't kill a giant with a rock or anything like that. But the author of the Hebrews wants us to know that there is something very important that this guy teaches us about Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know I was tempted to skip Melchizedek altogether today. But then I thought, I don't want some of you to get to heaven someday. And this guy comes up to you and he says, man, I'm so glad you're here. I'm Melchizedek. And you go, who? (laughs) No, no. I I want you to be able to say, oh, I know who you are. One One day I was at Fellowship Cabin. I heard somebody talk about you. Okay? I think there's a lot for us here to learn about the Lord Jesus through this guy named Melchizedek. Now, I want to be simple and straightforward with you today. Uh, There's a couple of things or questions that I want us to ask together today that I think are very important. First, who is this guy, Melchizedek? And then more importantly, what does Melchizedek show us about Jesus Christ? Okay, that's where we're headed today. 
So who was this guy, Melchizedek? Melchizedek, interestingly enough, is only mentioned two times in the Bible other than these mentions here in Hebrews. The most prominent of those is in Genesis 14. I don't want you to turn there in your Bible, but I do want you to follow along here in this text as we read this together. This is the moment where Abram went out to protect his cousin Lot from some ruthless kings, uh, ruthless kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And here's what happened upon his return. Verse 17. After his return, talking about Abram, from the defeat of Chedorlaomer, and the kings who were with him and the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva. That's the king's valley. And here he is. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And it says Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So who was Melchizedek? Well, we're told here, very simply, that Melchizedek was a king and a priest of the God Most High. That's who he was. He was the king and priest. Let's put that up there on the slide there. There we go. Perfect. Uh, Now, he seems to come out of nowhere. He has, uh, we don't know where he comes from. We have no background, no genealogy, uh, no lineage of this guy, Melchizedek. And after this moment here in Genesis, we don't hear anything about Melchizedek for a thousand years until King David in Psalm 110, and to be precise, verse 4, actually says that the coming Messiah would be of the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. And we actually, this prophecy is requoted in Hebrews chapter 5. We briefly talked about that a few weeks ago. So, so very little is written in the Bible about Melchizedek. But, but he served as a forerunner to Jesus Christ. And so the author of Hebrews wants us to know that he's in the Bible to teach us some things about Jesus. Now, I want to remind us that the Old Testament is about Jesus. The the New Testament is about Jesus. Friends, the whole Bible is about Jesus. It is one giant beautiful, grace-filled story that's interwoven together and it all points to one person, Jesus Christ, including Melchizedek. Now, so what does Melchizedek show us about Jesus Christ? Well, I want us to briefly talk about four things. I think there's four things there. If you're a note taker, you'll see them there on your outline. First is this, Jesus is our king and our priest. One of the things we see about Melchizedek is that he was both a king and a priest. Nobody in the Old Testament was like that. You know, these two positions, this king and priest were two positions that you never combined. You you never even wanted to combine. I mean, it would be like combining a NBA player and a referee or or combining a policeman and a pastor. It just doesn't make sense. The king was a lawgiver, a a judge. The priest was a friend, a, a, a counselor, somebody who was there for people in their struggles, in their pain when they messed up. The king represented God to the people. But but the priest represented the people to God. See, the king was a person of truth, but the priest was a person of tears. They were different. These two positions were never combined in the Old Testament because one person could not fulfill both of them with one exception. And that was Melchizedek. 
And the next person to do it was Jesus Christ. Look at what verse 14 says in Hebrews 7. It is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. This is saying that Jesus was not from the normal tribe of the Old Testament priest, which was the, the Levites. He's from what tribe? What does it tell us there in verse 14? Judah. That's a kingly tribe. That's a whole different kind of tribe altogether. So my question to you is how can Jesus be both a a, a king and a priest? How, How can he as a king be someone who's all about justice and truth, but at the same time be a priest who's all about mercy and grace and compassion? How can Jesus possibly be both of those? I'm going to tell you. The cross. Because the cross is where God's justice met God's mercy. That's where those two came together. There's an incredible story in Genesis 44. You can read it later today about Judah. Now, remember, Judah was actually one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And some of you are very familiar with this story if you've kind of been a part of the church world, but but Jacob favored his son Joseph. And, And so his brothers became very resentful of Joseph over time, and so they sold him into slavery to get rid of him. And But God's hand of favor was on Joseph. Joseph, if you know the story, he rose to power in Egypt, became a prime minister there. Eventually, a famine hit the land. By the way, I'm summarizing a lot here, but famine hit the land. His brothers come back. They don't recognize Joseph because it's been years. Now Joseph's in a position to help his brothers. So he decides to give his brothers food. But when he does that, What he does is he strategically places a silver cup in one of the bags of his brother Benjamin. You remember this story? Have you ever read this story? It's all a ruse that he's done here. He's doing that because he wants to see if his brothers have actually changed. So his brothers ride off with grain and all of that. They don't realize they have this silver cup. The guards catch up with them. They, They arrest them and they take Benjamin. And Joseph pronounces death on Benjamin. And in that moment in Genesis 44, it says that Judah steps forward and says, let me die in his place. What what an incredible picture of what Jesus has done for us. Because we were sentenced to die for our sin. But Jesus from the tribe of Judah, a king, died in our place. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The debt we owed to God because of our sin was paid in full by the Lord Jesus, so that now God can relate to us with mercy and acceptance, without compromising his justice. Because of our sin, we need a God who leads us with truth, like a king, and also with grace, like a priest. And Jesus embodies both of those perfectly, doesn't he? He's a king who's full of truth, and he's also a priest that's full of grace. In fact, John tells us in John 1, 14 that when Jesus came, he took on flesh, he he dwelt among us, and what does it say about him there at the end of the verse? He was full of what? Grace, he was a priest, and also truth. He was a king. Jesus is our king, and he is our priest. 
What a beautiful truth that we see here about the Lord Jesus. Here's a second thing that Melchizedek shows us about Jesus, and that is Jesus is worthy of our first and our best. Look again with me at what verses four and through seven say about this. It says, see how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils, And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have commandments in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Verse 7, it's beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. So after Abram won this battle, He didn't come back and strut and pat himself on the back. No, actually what we're told he did is he comes back and he actually gives to Melchizedek, who was in this moment representing God himself, he gave him the first and the best of his winnings, of his victory to say, thank you, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. So he gave him his first and his best. And I think in the same way, we who have been rescued and saved by Jesus, our king, our priest, we ought to thank him with our first and our best. He is worthy of everything, of our giving. James 1.17 says it this way, says every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. That means that everything you enjoy in your life, listen, is a gift from God. Your health, if you have it today, your job, your family, your home, your stuff, everything is a gift of grace from God to you, to me. And one of the ways we show how thankful we are is we give back to God with our money, with our, with our time, with our talents. That, that out of a, a place of gratitude and thanks, Jesus gets our first and our best because he's worthy of it because of all the grace that he's shown us. Is that true in your life? I mean, as you you think about your giving, are you generous in your giving? Or are you you a person that kind of holds on to your stuff and your things and all these gifts that you've been given? Or are you a person that lives your life with open hands and an open heart? when it comes to the resources that you've been given? What what about your talents? Man, as I look around this room, there's a lot of talented people. The skills, abilities that, that you've been given, that I've been given, how are you harnessing those for the kingdom? How, how are you serving here in a, in a meaningful way here at Fellowship? Giving God your first and the best of your talents and your abilities. What about your time? Does Jesus get the best and the first of your time? Does he get the the first slot on your calendar of activities? Or is he kind of delegated way down the calendar? Jesus is worthy of the first and the best in our life. Why? Because all that we are, all that we have comes from him. And one of the ways that we thank him, we show him gratitude, is by giving him our first and our best. Now, the author of the book of Hebrews is attempting to convince these people in the first century and us in the 21st century that Jesus is the only high priest who can bring us to God, that he's the only mediator. He's the only one that can really vouch for us. The temptation they were facing was to put their hope and trust in the priesthood of the old covenant. 
the priesthood of the Mosaic law, the priesthood of Aaron and his descendants. And so most of chapter seven into chapter eight is really showing the flaws and the shortcomings of this older priesthood in comparison to the newer, better priesthood of Jesus Christ. All of which leads the writer here to this incredible conclusion in verse 25. I want you to look at it with me. Here is the consequence of that comparison. Let me read it to you. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, talking about Jesus, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, there are two very important truths about Jesus in this verse. These truths are life-giving. They are hope-giving. They are joy-awakening and heart-thrilling in their force and their implication. And I want you to receive these important truths. Here's the first one. Jesus can save to the uttermost. He can save to the uttermost. Utter, uttermost means to the utmost degree. It, it means that nothing in the salvation Christ provides is lacking in any way. It means there's nothing defective in what Christ has done or, or in the reconciliation with God that he's provided for us. It, it means that when Jesus saves us, it's complete it, and it's whole and it's all-encompassing. And friends, we struggle to believe that because we think surely somewhere there must be someone who is simply too sinful to be saved. And maybe that someone is me. Surely somewhere, perhaps right here in the person of myself, there's someone whose failures are simply too many for Christ to save. We think our failures, our sin, our shortcomings are maybe just too much, too great for the salvation Christ offers to be overcome. And that's how a lot of us at one time or another tend to think. That there have to be limits to what even Jesus can do, right? There has to be a point beyond which he cannot and will not go. I mean, no one is that patient, that, that good, that loving. No one. Is that merciful, that gracious, that forgiving? At least that's how we tend to think about Jesus. We surmise in our thinking that everything has a limit, a boundary, a, a point beyond which maybe not even Jesus will go. But the point here in verse 25 is that our thinking is way way off base and misguided. The point of verse 25 is that we have sold God short and we have horribly misjudged what he's like and have terribly underestimated what he has done and will continue to do. That's the point of the word uttermost. This word is saying that there's no links to which God in Christ won't go to save you. How beautiful is that? There, this word is saying that there are no sins you've committed, are committing, or listen to this, will in the future commit that are beyond the power of Christ to forgive. This work is saying, this word is saying that what Christ has accomplished for you, no one else ever has, can, or will, and that he has left nothing undone. He has not failed to make provision for your every need, for my every need. He has not failed to do that. So when you begin to wonder if there are limits to his love, I remind you that he saves to the uttermost. When you begin to feel overwhelmed with shame and guilt because you've committed the same sin again and again, I remind you 
that he saves to the uttermost. When you struggle to believe that a holy God would let a sinful wretch like you, like me, into his presence, I remind you that he saves to the uttermost. When you think that God is disappointed, that God is angry with you, that God is done with you because you're not the the faithful Christ follower that you need to be, I remind you that he saves to the uttermost. And some of you in here, if you don't hear anything else today, because some of you walk through these doors and you've been thinking to yourself that your sin is too great, that maybe you're beyond the love of God, maybe beyond the, the salvation of God. Here's what I want you to walk away with today. This is the one thing. Jesus can save anyone, anywhere, anytime. Let me say that again. I don't want, you don't have to remember anything else we talk about today. Some of you need to hear that and know that Jesus saves to the uttermost. Which means that no matter who you are, no matter how checkered your past is, no matter whether you grew up in the church, never grew up in the church, no matter what you've done, no matter how many sins you've committed, whatever you've done, you are not too far gone. And you say, well, how do I receive this salvation? How how do I get saved to the uttermost? Well, Romans 10 says, all you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. More than anything, Jesus wants to save you to the uttermost. And his love, his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection is bigger than any sin in your life. And he will save you to the uttermost. What a beautiful truth. What an amazing, incredible truth that Jesus saves us to the uttermost. Guess what? It gets better. It's hard to imagine that it could get any better, but it gets better. Look what the writer says this second truth is. Not only does Jesus save us to the uttermost, By the way, that is what makes him so much better than this guy named Melchizedek. Man, are you kidding me? Melchizedek couldn't save anybody to the uttermost. But look at this second powerful truth. Jesus always lives to intercede for us. Look at the end of verse 25. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. I want you to circle that word always. The word always speaks to a duration, means never ending, never ceasing. It points to something that's incessant, eternal, everlasting. And this is really hard for us to grasp because everything we experience has a shelf life. Everything we eat or drink has an expiration date. It says good until May 14th, 2024 on the milk carton, Right? I mean, we have to change our oil, or at least we're supposed to in our car, every 5,000 miles. You're supposed to change your filter on your air conditioning unit every, every six months. It's probably a smart move at least once a year to change out the batteries in your smoke alarms. I mean, everything we experience in life has this kind of short duration. Nothing seems to last always. Even think about marriage. What what do we say on our wedding day? We say, I take you to be my wedded wife, my my wedded husband, till death do us part. Nothing lasts. But one thing lasts forever, and that's the heavenly intercession on your behalf of Jesus Christ, our great priest. Now, how cool is that? That Jesus, hear that word, is always interceding for those who love and trust and follow Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means first and foremost, you and I can come to God anytime, 
We can come to God anytime because our intercessor is alive at the right hand of the Father, always interceding for us. But not just that. This picture of Jesus' work of intercession means that he's always working for your good and my good. He's always in the midst of our struggles. He's always interceding, hoping that we'll persevere in the midst of temptation. He's interceding for our power to make it through times of suffering. I I think about when I intercede for someone That's me saying, I want to pray for that person. I want to represent that person before God and ask for God's blessings in their life on their behalf. So the picture we have of Jesus right now and always is that's what he's doing for us. He's dispensing the blessings of God in your life and in my life. The grace, the strength, the mercy that we need at every point of our lives. He's dispensing it as our intercessor. Friends, as we wrap up here, let me ask you this. I wonder if the band wants to come up. I wonder how it would change our lives if we really believed these two important truths. What, what I mean is if we sincerely genuinely and consistently believe that that Jesus saves to the uttermost and that Jesus is always interceding for us. I I just wonder to myself, would would that change the way you worship? Would it change the way I worship? Would there be a part of us that would would never want to stop or cease praising God because of all that he's done for us through the work of Jesus Christ? Would it change the way we give? Would it change the way we serve if we would really wrap our hearts and our lives around these life-altering, life-changing, hope-filled truths about Jesus? The whole Bible is about Jesus. The whole Bible is pointing us to a loving Savior who can save us to the uttermost. A Savior who loves us so much that he's always interceding on our behalf. A Savior who's not just a king. He does want to rule your life and my life, but he's also a priest. A priest who's compassionate and loving and caring. But he's also worthy of the first and the best in your life and in my life. That's our King. That's our Lord Jesus. He is worthy. Let's pray together. God, would you open up the eyes of our heart? Would you take these truths that you show us in your word here in Hebrews 7 and on into chapter 8, this truth about you. You you are worthy of the the first and the best in our life. You are a priest, you are a king. And you even save us to the uttermost. There's nothing that can separate us from you. There's no sin that's too great for you. We don't have to walk in shame and guilt because our salvation in you is complete. And Lord, even now, you are interceding for us. And we desperately need someone that can vouch for us, that can speak for us, that can mediate for us. You're doing that out of your love for us. Lord, may that change the way we live our lives. May it shape us each and every day. We give you all that we are, all that we have, because you are worthy. In Jesus' name. stand and respond to the word that we've heard today.
forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life you ain't above it all you ain't above it all and over the universe and over every heart there is no Cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now, from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem arise. He's Jesus, your. Us. You guys can be seated. As we wrap up this morning, just know if God's working in your life at all, we'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you today and talk with you. Maybe today, uh, the beautiful Word of God, you've realized that you need Christ as that intercessor, as that Savior, as that King. And no greater privilege for us to have those conversations right here at our front as some of our staff and elders or our connection center either place. Also on the bottom of your bulletin, there's a little tear off section. You could tear off, put your information in check. I'd love for someone to follow up with me. Love to know more about knowing Christ as my Savior and put that in our offering box and we will follow up with you on that as well. So any of those ways you can respond today. Or maybe today you just need prayer for something you're walking through. 
Uh, some of our staff and elders are right here and love that opportunity to pray with you. Hey, as we wrap up this morning, this morning is our next step, um, our fellowship next class that we have. We offered about once a quarter and in the next step room, which is right off of our lobby, right out this way. Even if you didn't sign up, we would love for you to be a part of that this morning. If you'd like to know more information or get to know more about who our church is and, and uh, the church that you're, you're attending. And so F- fellowship next is the spot for that. Uh, we have a good group, I think, that's going to be in there this morning, but feel free if you're interested in that at all to slide in there. It'll start about 1030. And then the next two weeks, last two weeks of April are our membership class. Now, some of you, I think, have already signed up for that, but we'd love uh, for you to sign up for that. If you haven't yet, come grab me, talk to me. We can get you signed up, or you can send an email to any of our staff, grab our card. Uh, We'd love to get you signed up for that membership class that's going to happen these next two weeks as our elders lead that about once a quarter as well. Hey, church, we love you guys. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, May you have an incredible Sunday afternoon. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you.
sing this with me. When we pray.